going to go ahead, you know, those who come in, and um, I'm sure I'm looking forward to actually publishing my papers, so you would have that um, in, in one of the publications that will follow from you. Okay, so for the purpose of this paper, um, I will mainly be focusing on specific victims who are particularly vulnerable to victimization. Um, I think I might as well say that first of all, I've left that up so a lot of people would know my name is Gloria de Costa. I'm a, a lecturer in the Department of Criminology at the University of South Africa. So I'm not going to try and go through details. Uh, the paper overview that I'm doing at the moment is just the recent South African examples of violence against children, personal influence that that would be the parents and the caregivers of the children, the social environments, the surrounding, the family, communities, and school. And I'm also going to just um, touch on the lifestyle of the victim and then some concluding remarks. Okay, so the introduction, as I was saying, is victimization of children in South Africa. It's diff very difficult to ascertain for amongst many reasons is the underreporting and unknown extent of this phenomenon that blur the true picture. Although victimization is viewed as a social problem that is real, present, media coverage actually shows a significant underestimation of the social problem. Violence against children in, in South Africa. However, estimations that are globally almost one billion children are subject to victimization each year. After conducting surveys in 20 different countries, Finkel Hoare reports that the prevalence of child sexual abuse is rampant. We just listened to our speakers before this, and um, we hear that pets are abused just so horribly, and now I come to the, the sad and, and very horrific story of the, ch the children in the home being abused. So the child victim vulnerability may be defined as the likelihood of a child becoming a victim of crime and frequently violent crime. Children are one of the most vulnerable population groups affected by crime. The likelihood of victimization is determined by different factors including the victim's behavior, personal lifestyle and interaction with the offender. Vulnerability to victimization can therefore be viewed is a result of the interplay between the different complex factors, as violence is seldom a result of a single factor. Factors that might contribute to victimization of children are abuse, maltreatment, neglect, poverty, social isolation. The interplay between the variables that influence risk behavior, such as the personal, physical, and social environmental aspects. Now I want to give you um, a quick scenario. Is child victimization, according to you, would you see child victimization as crime? And I'm going to give you two scenarios that would put this nicely into perspective for us. Scenario one, and this was by Finkel, 2008. He said Joyce was busy at a desk. She did not see the assailant coming, running through the door, clobbered her on her head and ran off. Joyce fell to the floor screaming. Now in scenario A, Joyce is a 25-year-old woman. Her co-worker reached for the phone and dialed 911. In scenario B, Joyce is a 5-year-old. The kindergarten teacher looks up and says, what's going on here? Can we see the difference? Every day, children find themselves in a variety of circumstances where they are victimized. According to Hutchin and Priya Darsani, victimization of children should correctly be referred to as crime against children. Some circumstances are directly related to personal, family, and social environment, whereas others are related to political unrest, human trafficking, war, drought, and diseases such as AIDS. While violence against children is not justifiable, research confirmed that violence against children can be prevented if the underlying causes are identified and correctly treated. Before leaving to Washington, let me say before I go to my next slide, 
these were actually the recent developments of violence against children in South Africa. Things might, might have changed in the two days that I left. In fact, it often, it often has changed and is really bad. Okay, so the most recent developments was a 20-year-old who, his name is Nicholas Nina, appeared in court on charges of raping a seven-year-old in a toilet of a dross restaurant. So this happened at a restaurant. The seven-year-old was in playing in a play area. Um, Nina watched the seven-year-old and then followed her to the bathroom where he raped her. There was uh, another horrible uh, one that the state spring monster, he's called the Springs Monster because it's a place in South Africa called Springs. I'll go back also to Nina just now. Um, you'll see it happened in Silverton, South Africa because he was uh, accused of raping this girl in the bathroom there. It's also just, it's, it's like a family restaurant. So you have a play area. And then the Springs monster that we, we've also just heard about is a father of five. But unfortunately, imagine five children living in a house with this father and then having to go, I think, you, I don't even want to um, think on, on what has taken place in that house, but it was a four-year trial very, very horrible four-year throw. And he was finally, the father was just before I, I came <coughs> over to Washington, he was sentenced to 35 years um, for obviously various different crimes, but the ones where he was found guilty of severe abuse of his five children, of raping his eldest daughter, and of drug possession and obstruction of justice. And what I said to you earlier on, this is basically just a touch of what is happening in South Africa at the moment. I unfortunately can't uh, give you everything. Can I ask a question? Is 35 years unusual or in its length for the sentence, or is that what one would expect? That's what one would expect now, before it was actually taken more for granted, and we had people actually getting five years, mm -hmm. a father like that getting a five-year sentence or two-year sentence. So because of the, the recent um, development and what I'll be speaking about, yeah, okay. there, there seems to be some kind of, of um, help towards that, where people are, are seeing this as more horrific than it it is and the right sentences are passed but it's not always the case too. Um, I'm going back to the Ninao trial. The, the woman, um, a 37 year old woman attended the rape trial of this 20 year old only because she was also raped 25 years ago and we unfortunately have a lot of that woman coming out after 25 years, after 35, after 40 years mm -hmm. and then stating that I am here because I'm standing with the seven-year-old victim and I'm looking for justice for her. And what is even more sad, if you look further down, she's also now, actually she fears for a nine-year-old daughter. She also has a nine-year-old daughter and she doesn't know with what is happening in South Africa if that is actually, if her daughter would be able to see 17 without having been victimized. Because you'll see some of the the unfortunately uh, um, said statistics. The other thing that's happening in South Africa at the moment is something um, that one of the reporters referred to as child soldiers. That um, you will notice that that obviously won't be a correct term. So I've, I've termed it as child combatants in Hanover Park in Cape Town. It's a, a township in, in South Africa. It was reported that a 15-year-old with an unlicensed gun referred to himself as a soldier in the local gang. Furthermore, there were 32 killings a month committed by the youth recorded in September last year alone. That means more than a month. <laughs> um, reports show that there has been an increase of numbers of child combatants in Athlone alone. And Athlone is also another um, suburb or we actually call it a township because of apartheid 
there were certain coloreds that were moved to colored townships, like I would be known as a colored. My colleague would be known as an Indian in, in South Africa. And so she would live in an Indian community and I'd live in a colored community. And Cape Town is known, majority of us are colored communities that come from there. And so in Atlone alone, they, they're looking at a, a horrible increase of child combatants and uh, in number in South Africa has grown to over 10,000. The parental um, personal influences that parents and caregivers give. Parents serve as natural caregivers, educators and protectors of their children. If one or both of the parents fail in any of these areas, <coughs> we notice that the child is immediately placed at risk. And as our previous speakers were, were talking, we notice that if an animal doesn't have a person that's going to care for that animal, think about if a parent doesn't care for a child. Um, a South African study that, it was one of my studies that I did, I, I did a, a study on female youth sex offending for my master's degree. And I found out that um, a parent or a caregiver who optimally cares for, a ch uh, for children and tells basic care entails emotional warmth, ensuring safety, stimulation, and guidance for children. However, neglect, on the other hand, we can see, is defined as the failure by parents or caregivers to provide children with basic necessities. Also, uh, the child, child abuse by parents or caregivers takes many forms, such as physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, or intentional maltreatment. Sexual abuse of children, especially in the family circle, is just one type of child abuse. It's, you know, I wrote in my paper the one worst type of child abuse, but I suppose, you know, you can really never talk about the worst type of child abuse. But the one that I was just speaking to you about just now is when a, a parent takes the innocence, the child's innocence through incest. So that's sexual activities between individuals who are closely re related by kinship. And like I gave you, the current example is about the Springs monster. They've actually called him that because, like I said, a father raping his eldest daughter. Another type of sexual abuse that is rife in families is child on child sexual abuse. Female youth sex offenders in particular often choose young children, mostly male victims, frequently younger than five years to victimize. It's also stated that sexual abuse against children occurs, the perpetrators are more likely to be males, 70%, and more females are charged for neglecting children. The effect of sexual abuse could be devastating. Sexually abused children usually suffer from, from disrupted personality development, guilt and shame, and may also suffer from post-traumatic post -traumatic stress disorder and a poor self-esteem. Several studies found a close connection between sexual abuse and adolescent prostitution. Studies done on the effect of sexual abuse on children have shown that victims reported that they suffer significantly more than mental health disorders compared to children who are exposed to sexual abuse. Several researchers concluded that most youth sex offenders might possibly be victims of sexual abuse themselves since childhood experiences of, of physical abuse, neglect and witnessing family violence are most likely related to sexual violence in youth sex offenders. So I actually did find that out in my study. Youth sex offenders, unfortunately, unfortunately most of them were actually victims of abuse. Um, other risk factors of violence against children include ignorance about the child's development and the lack of parental training. These types of parents interpret the child's inability to react in a certain way as intentional and punish the child mercilessly. Parent training as early as infant care can be effective in reducing the risk of parents sorry, the risk of parents abusing their children physically, verbally, or neglecting them. 
based on the outcomes of empirical research on the effect of parents on adolescents, family-based prevention and intervention programs for parents and adolescents were developed. These programs are intended to inform adolescents and parents on methods to improve parental or caregiver skills and strengthen child-parent interrelationships. Hoskin referred to some of the programs such as enhancing parenting skills for fathers, protecting adolescents against high-risk behaviors and community-based programs, focusing on the influence that the community and parents have on adolescents. Some of the community-based prevention programs in South Africa that are available and that actually assist with crime prevention against children are something called Isibindi. Children are precious. One man can. Stepping stones and prepare. I would like to speak a little bit about the Isibindi program which provides psychosocial support to help vulnerable and orphan children affected by HIV and AIDS cope with emotional problems. Additionally, a South African example of an effective infant care program is also called Tulasana. Both these programs, the Isibindi and the Tulasana, are actually um, UNICEF um, organized also and working together with them and the World Health Organization. The Tulasana program necessitates an intervention to enhance the mother-infant relationship and infant attachment to assist with positive child development skills. In addition, pro programs such as Tulasana supports the development of early child behavior and promotes positive parenting skills. The intervention is conducted by trained health workers that help the mother to sensi sensitize her to the baby's needs and capacities. The intervention begins in the last trimester of pregnancy and becomes intensive for the six months after birth. Now, what happens in the uh, Tulas Sana program, I actually was able to visit with one of our colleagues who, who did the program at that time, I think it was about four or five years ago, and they were giving feedback about the, the program. It was very fascinating for me because some of our African cultures didn't believe a baby could start talking to you already in the womb. It was amazing. So they, they were taught that that was already happening from the last trimester and you could already talk to baby and stuff in the womb. And then afterwards also that first six months, which was so important to attachment, they didn't know that that would happen. In fact, the mothers wouldn't even talk to the babies. They, it didn't mean anything to them. And then it, they brought up this program, which is the Tulasana. And it, it actually was an amazing program to see in action because I actually seen a mum realize that she can communicate with this little baby of three months old and the baby knew exactly what the baby wanted. And um, that, all, that added to a lot of good attachment. Um, also developmental skills and then also good attachment and parental skills from the parents. Uh, furthermore, the most global recent activity in this regard, like I said to you already, the organizations such as, such as the United Nation, National Children's Fund, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization are part of the team that has driven the process of preventing violence against children in a global arena. The advocate, they advocate the parent and caregiver support as one of the core seven strategies. Um, I think I'll just go over to the next slide. So our social environments, the child victimization occurs especially in families where one parent or both parents come from a violent family, where the family is dysfunctional, where the parents abuse drugs and alcohol, or where there is a serious mal marital conflict. I think we just heard about that also. Um, and that also leads, our social environments actually re lead to the violence against children. Uh, talking about obviously uh, difficult and uh, troublesome social environments. Researchers do not only study individual risk factors, but also the relationship between the various factors that contribute to victimization. Uh, Bacroft proposes that antisocial children are not islands in time or in space. These children were parented by unique people in a specific ways and in societies where several attitudes were discouraged 
while other attitudes were promoted. The recent South African examples of violence against children attest to this view. Consequently, researchers concluded that antisocial parents tend to raise antisocial children. Physical violence between parents is dangerous to children, not only because of the negative effect of observing violence, but also because children could become targets of violence, as is seen in the gang violence in the Cape Flats in South Africa. Furthermore, the gang violence and fabrication of child combatants by gang members who are recruiting children as young as nine years old. They provide them with unlicensed gun guns and then train them to shoot and kill rival gangs. Moreover, the results of 2017 study by Children's Institute of the University of Cape Town shows that one in three children will experience ex sorry, will experience sexual or physical abuse before the age of 18. This factor of continued high levels of violence in the community brings about antisocial children who focus on violence as a lifestyle. Bullying also has an impact on children in South Africa. I wrote an article a while with a, a colleague and one of the horrible bully experiences that was mentioned in that article was where three bullies allegedly forced a 16-year-old girl to drink a bottle of household detergent, which is Jig, which resulted in a death. The school environment is viewed as one of the unsafe places for victimization, with school violence rates showing a national high of 22.2%. And you also spoke about this. Multiple or poly victimization is the terms that researchers are using now to report children are being victimized on multiple levels and throughout their childhood. And one of the things that we could actually use now from this is that children are also being victimized with their pet, for instance. Um, Gal suggests that in order to reduce the poly victimization, researchers and all those who work with children victims should respect their needs and rights. Stain um, is one of our criminologists back home. He argues that instead of merely researching the symptoms, researchers should focus on the root causes of the problem. Now, um, I've just heard that INSPIRE is um, an action for implementing, for implementing the seven strategies for ending violence against children. And their strategies such as implementing and enforcing laws, that was one of the things we've been fighting for a long time in South Africa because we have good laws now, but unfortunately they're not being implemented. Then building on good norms and values, creating of safe environments, this is what my paper is all about, and facilitating parent and caregiver support, reinforcement of funds, alignment of response and support services, and ensuring education and life skills. I want to speak a little bit on the, the lifestyle of the victim. Like I've mentioned already, the child combatants used by the gangs are viewed as victims of their community and therefore their lifestyle of violence surrounded by a community of violence makes this even more difficult for them. Uh, you know, we back in South Africa, although I live in Pretoria, uh, first Johannesburg and now Pretoria because I work more in Pretoria, but whenever you hear of the Cape gang violence, you, you know, my heart just cringes to think how their child lives day in and day out. And they basically just walking to school can be shot. Playing outside, they are shot. There's been numerous reports. If you just go up even on Google, you'll see the numerous reports of what, what we've just experienced now. Research showed that 80% of these children are school dropouts. That means they never finish school. They never even want to go back to school, especially if a school is also an unsafe place. And there are shooters, as I mentioned before, as young as nine years old. These gangsters are using these children to actually pay their debt by killing rival gangs. So there is an indication of widespread poverty in parts of South Africa. Uh, 
Children become victims of poor economic and political policy decisions. They die from diseases that are ascribed to poor socioeconomic conditions such as poverty, un overpopulation, uncontrolled urbanization, and the consequent lack of proper housing, nutrition, and medical care. Um, I also just want to touch on the fact that there's um, disadvantaged and poverty stricken families and neighborhoods that are breeding grounds of exposure to all forms of victimization. And Peacock and Rosenblatt refer to street children as actually community children. We also suffer a lot with street children in South Africa. But they refer to street children as community children because they're saying they actually come. Where does the street children come from? From the communities. And um, it, it also shows that, unfortunately, these street children are victimized and are, are found by unscrupulous adults um, and oftentimes human trafficked. So the worldwide, the vast majority of street children are boys, but the number of girls are also an increase which is really sad to know. And several factors such as poverty, unemployment, overpopulation, abuse, disintegration of family and alcohol abuse by parents contribute to children choosing a life on the street. Uh, like I mentioned, it's insufferable conditions at home that force many children to leave home and become street children where they are deprived of adequate care, nutrition, and um, in order to survive, these street children help motorists to find parking, wash cars, sell fruit and vegetables, um, and others unfortunately practice prostitution and sell drugs. The coping mechanisms of street children are to use drugs, mainly sniff glue and use alcohol so that they can stay awake at night and minimize the risk of being further abused and to help them cope with hunger. Um, there are street, street children who are particularly vulnerable to social, sexual, and psychological abuse. And I'm just going to end off with, um, it was furthermore reported that there are about 40,000 child prostitutes and many more of South Africa's 18 million children are at risk of becoming victims of sexual exploitation. I just want to go back there. Um, as can be seen by this dismal picture of South Africa's children and their vulnerability, oftentimes these children are too young to complain or lack the resources to report the abuse, just as was mentioned by the pet um, abuse. Um, and they are very dependent of their caregivers. When discussing children as vulnerable victims, the author takes the following into consideration. A child's dep dependence on an adult for care, defenselessness to child abuse, the impact of family violence on the child, and parental ignorance, the influence of a violent community, and the vulnerability of street. Uh, sorry, the vulnerability of street children. I just wanted to also say that um, research has shown that Approximately 785,000 youth in South Africa are likely to have been victimized before the age of 17 years. Furthermore, vulnerable young people and adolescents who are involved in activities outside their domestic environment tend to hang out in groups and become involved in the typical age. The typical age group of range for a child, a gang, is 12 to 24 years. The vulnerability of the youth to crime victimization may likely be related to their lifestyle, as can also be seen by two examples that I just want to highlight. There was one girl, she's 18 years old, uh, went to school, grade 10 pupil, who was stabbed by a boyfriend um, on the school grounds 14 times, jealous boyfriend, because she, she didn't show up that weekend and just got to school. Um, and then again, just uh, which I think I mentioned already, the violence in Hanover Park in Cape Town, South Africa. A 15-year-old was found with an unlicensed gun, gun and refers to himself as a soldier in the local gang. gang. So in my concluding remarks, um, the, like I said, child soldiers would be a total wrong um, term to be used here. According to the Convention on Rights of the Child, deemed to be in armed conflict, child soldiers at present is referred to as the rebel armed forces. 
One of the advocates at the Pretoria Bar is registered for his doctorate regarding international child soldiers and he states that the gang violence in South Africa at the moment should be looked and seen as civil war. He advocates for rehabilitation and demobilization of these child combatants. Then there are two um, things that I would just like to, to mention and highlight. As much as I want to create safe spaces in, for children, like we said in, in the Isibindi, we have a need for integrated model of service for child survivors of rape. The following departments in the criminal justice system of South Africa, such as the Department of Social Development, Department of Health, the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, and the National Prosecuting Authority, should be mandated to work together with all stakeholders toward the prevention of violence against children and to provide better services and support for child survivors. That is really lacking in our country at the moment. Also what is lacking, although ECBND is one of the programs I said that actually does the psychosocial intervention regarding child rape, um, it is very far and in between. We do have centres called the Tutuzala Care Centres, but that is also far and in between. So we're really lacking in those services at the moment in South Africa and especially with what we're facing. Um, the immediate measure highlighted in this paper paper is to create safe spaces for children in every area of their lives and to raise awareness of vigilant parents, caregivers, teachers and all relevant stakeholders regarding the prevention and violence against children. The current state of violence against children in South Africa is indicated as a national disaster. At a 2017 National Child Protection Week, the urgent consensus of those involved with the protection of children agrees for a strong political will, increased funds, personal commitment from government and all stakeholders to address this social disease as they call it. After the Dross incident that I spoke to you earlier on, the restaurant, Dr. Omar, who is the director of the Teddy Bear Clinic, um, calls for a clear protection policies to, it's actually child protection policies that I added in there, to be displayed in play areas. Furthermore, she stated that restaurants could actually be accused of situational neglect if there are no rigorous child protection measures in place. I just want to affirm um, that again the multiple victimization experience of, of children in South Africa is needed to inform early interventions to protect society's children from continued victimization. The contemporary work done by Inspire will assist South Africa's government, organizations, and all re relevant stakeholders to ensure that the seven strategies are wisely implemented in order to guarantee the need to eradicate violence against children. I also agree with the urgent plea from all stakeholders involved with violence against children for not only the imperative funding of the resources, because that's what we all always cry for, but as stakeholders to become more vigilant, active agents for change and to set in motion the necessary networking systems and tools to prevent violence against children. I just read the, the recent um, article of Pius Langa, one of my colleagues that presented, I think, in 2017 year. And one of the statements right at the back of the book says, we must stop talking now, and action is required. I would like to end with that. Thank you so much. Questions? Yes. Who has ultimate authority over all of this? I mean, is it, are children dealt with more at the local level? It is a, wide social service agency so where where's the first um, if, first place you would look for relief for children okay it's, it would be our SAPs at the moment but we've also got um, organizations such as that uh, that I mentioned now that and they're private yes that 
unfortunately there's private and government but we this is my call at the moment to create safe spaces so that we could actually it shouldn't only be to go to the SEPs we've got something called sorry the SEPs is the South African Police Services so you would go to them and then they've got victimization rooms there or victim rooms rather and in the victim rooms the the person who has been raped or whatever's happened to the person you'd be able to to get help there but I was what I'm stating is that it should be we, we're hoping for primary prevention so that it doesn't even have to get there um, places like teddy bear clinic that I mentioned to you are organizations that where children who have been raped or have been molested in any way goes there and then are, are, are sent from there to the hospital so yeah we've got those kind of centers how do the experiences of the children in South Africa who experience victimization, how do they differ um, based on their ethnicity? Because I know you said you guys um, historically have been separated by ethnicity or color. Yes. So how how do these experiences vary or what's reported? Like do you get more reports of color children? Yes, I, I think, you know, to, to talk, um, from, from my viewpoint, because we, we have um, most of our, our uh, people at the moment are, are black in our country, so you'd have a bigger population from there. But I would still say that they, it wouldn't only be from there, because although the colored community is, is supposed to be much smaller than the black community, I also see it very rife in the colored community. So, um, yeah, you know, I just, I, I, and, and for instance, the Springs Monster was a white community, from a white community. Um, the, uh, the gangs that I was talking about was from a colored community. So, and then, you know, if you talk about places like Isibindi and stuff, I would think that they, they focus a lot on the black community but it doesn't mean that that's where the whole problem lies, only with that community. So I, I would say that for me, when I look at South Africa, every child is important and every child for me is struggling under the violence and the victimization that children are going through in South Africa. It is really, for me, a national disaster that I've seen. Basically, child abuse across, across race lines mm. and, and ethnicity and class and poverty. So you would find abuse in all communities, um, in your impoverished communities, in your uh, rich mm. communities, you would find abuse and victimization. So we, we, you cannot put a label to it and, and the stats will also indicate that you see that there's uh, abuse taking across uh, all communities within South Africa. <laughs> what age does your criminal code define a child as? Under the age of 18. 18. Under the age of 18. Yes. So I didn't do any key concepts and stuff because, you know, that's a lot in my other papers. So, yeah, but I, you know, if you look at it, uh, we look at our um, youth as um, also we try and look at child and youth under the age of 18 but then you you find the youth would then go from 18 to 24 so that's also yes but it all depends also what you're writing on and what you're dealing with because it, it yeah mm -hmm. yes do you have mandated reporters of child abuse in your I think um, at the moment what we're having as you're talking about the reports that come no, out sorry no, I'm of talking, people uh, the mandated reporters in the US would be like if you're a physician oh, yeah, yeah, I you, are, it, yeah. you are required to report oh to child oh yes oh yes oh, yeah. no now what what has happened um, since the criminal um, sexual offenses act and we've got a new child justice act which is well, it's not even new anymore, but um, if we implement that correctly, what should actually be happening is that if I'm sitting with a child and I'm a teacher and the child had reported that that child is, I have 
if, if I do not, yes, I'm obligated to report that. And it's supposed to have been also, and this is why the situation with uh, Nicholas Ninao is so um, sensitive at the moment and, and yeah, really hitting the core because before I left, I also found out that his, his grandmother was looking after children. So this, this man has been around children, it seems like, all his life, you know, and, and one of his, when he, when he uh, wrote his, or, or the, I think they, they did a video on him, and it was said that um, he loves working with children, was one of the things, you know, and so, yeah, so we, we have that, and we've got something called the National uh, Register for Child Offenders. So any child child offender, like for instance, yeah, Nino would if once he's been sentenced or whatever, he goes onto the child. And when you are working in a care centre for children, or the, you are actually you've got the right to look at that list and make sure that none of your workers have been ever been offended. Yeah. So when one of your um, points was that the director of the Teddy Bear Clinic wanted to ex wanted to include restaurants giving notice and play areas she, is, that, okay. is that a way to expand the mandatory reporting or is that for like civil lawsuits if someone wanted to sue the restaurant okay no what she was saying is because i i i would think that maybe there wasn't a clear child minding kind of um um legal something stating up that the the child is safe here and the child would uh, because what had happened was, I believe, there were two or three people overlooking the play area. It was just something that the restaurant did. But they didn't see anything. And so sh she's, she's calling for clearer guidelines and, uh, I would think, notices that um, the child is safe to be played um, in that area. If the, it, you know, notices that they, they go up and say that the child is safe in this area, because that is not, it's, it's not seen as a big thing anymore. Um, and I think that's one of the things that they're calling for. Also, sorry, related to the age, child's age, as for what defines a child, you also, one of your points was that the Convention on the Rights of a Child defines child combatants. You would define a child combatant as not a victim, no. But, but a no, no, but no. A, a combatant as opposed uh, to the child. Does the convention also define what a child is? Um, like say, I, say I, the combatant was sixteen as opposed to eleven, right? Do they still consider the eleven-year-old to be a combatant and not a child or a victim? As far as I know, when I spoke to the advocate, or maybe I must ask my <laughs> the advocate to come in there. The, as far as I know, child combatants are known as victims too because remember these what, whatever they're going through they're also a victim of the circumstances right. and society's criminality okay. Okay. so yeah so that's why I I've, I've, I've rather call them child combatants but the media had actually spoken about these child combatants as child soldiers and I'm mentioning that we cannot use the child soldier term because it's an international term and I, I know according to an advocate that's busy writing his doctorate on it, that that's not even a relevant term at the moment. Can they call them rebel something, yeah. You know, my sister, we have in South Africa a legislation that defines what is a child. And any, any young adult who's under the age of 18 is regarded as a child. Uh, the term combatant is a term that was coined by gang members coined by the media. So it's not a legislative term that combat. Uh, in, 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 in terms of our law, that would sort of be regarded as a child. If he was carrying a firearm, and even if he's a, a perpetrator of a crime, he's still a child in terms mm. of our law. And he'll be treated as a child until he's 18. So the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, is that I thought that was part of the... Um, oh, yes, it is. Is it part of the, the rights of a child? Uh, yeah. That's a South African and not a. Um, the United Nations. No, that's the United Nations. United Nations. No, that's, Nations. It's in line with the United okay. Nations. Okay, but the what you were yeah. talking about was the South African version. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's in line with the United Nations. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, are we done? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>